Hello again, Pastor Wagner. Uh, I rewatched your video. I made the first video, and then I think I need to make part two because uh, I noticed a lot of more things that I forgot to address and a lot more errors that you made in regards to Calvinism. Um, you claim that Calvinism has seven points. And, uh, I don't know of any Calvinist with, that would actually say that. That's just uh, your made-up opinion. But anyway, I would like I would like to address more things, and I, I want to correct some of your errors in love, of course. Um, when it comes to uh, representing, uh, a, you know, your bro your brother in Christ um, and what he believes, it's very important to be accurate, because if you're inaccurate or if you misrepresent what someone else believes, especially if it's your brother in Christ. That is bearing false witness. So hopefully I would be uh, as faithful and accurate to the facts as I can in my represent uh, representation of what you believe. Okay, so yes, it's false that Calvinists believe in seven points. True Calvinists actually believe uh, in, in the canons of Dort, where we get the five points of Calvinism. Now it's unknown who came up with the acronym, uh, acronym TULIP and the different labels, uh, but the canons of Dort is regarded as the standard for what Calvinists believe. So I encourage you to go online and read the Canons of Dort and check out to see if you agree with all of uh, all of those, uh, well, uh, if you agree with the general uh, uh, message of the Canons of Dort. Uh, that's where we get tulips, so that's usually regarded as the standard. <clears throat> okay, so you mentioned, um, well, Regarding God's grace, uh, you said that, uh, I'm not 100% sure what you said, I'm not sure if you said God's grace is resistible or is irresistible. Uh, I'm not sure if you misspoke at some point, but um, you claim that the elect can resist the gospel or gra grace. I'm not sure which one you, you said there. According to Romans 11, 27 to 29, uh, unfortunately you quoted the passage very much out of context because verse 25 implies that the hardening of Israel will end eventually and therefore uh, they would have faith so if they're if they're no longer hardened that would imply that they come to faith rather than staying idolaters as you, as you would um, uh, as you would interpret and verses 4 and 5 mention the remnant according to election and Paul mentions a remnant from the Old Testament who are not idolaters, but those who have not bowed the knee to ba uh, Baal, or Baal. And the Old Testament verses uh, that Paul referenced in Romans 11 imply that the Jewish people trusted Jehovah. So he, he referenced Isaiah and Jeremiah, and if you look at those passages that he referenced, it actually implies that they had faith, that they put, they put, they put their trust in Jehovah. They were forgiven from their sin, but they weren't just idolaters forgiving their sin. It's a very much exaggerated interpretation. The Bible doesn't say that people remain idolaters, uh, permanent, unrepentant idolaters, and still go to heaven. The Bible actually says the opposite. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it says no idolater will inherit the kingdom of God. But in your theology, idolaters do inherit the kingdom of God, including the people of Israel in the wilderness, apparently. And you assume that the people of Israel in the wilderness were elect and saved and went to heaven even though they died as idolaters. Again, that contradicts what 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 10 say. Very, It's dangerous to say that idolaters can go to heaven. Again, uh, I'm wondering, uh, from a, a practical level, when you uh, share the gospel or evangelize to people, do you tell them, oh, it's okay, you can remain an idolater? You can, you, can, you can die an idolater, you can die an unbeliever, and you'll still go to heaven. Do you tell people that? Do you encourage perseverance? Because perseverance, I would say, is a godly action. It is, uh, it's honoring to God. But when you don't persevere, as I uh, demonstrated in the other video, uh, if you don't persevere, well, uh, that's dishonoring to God, and uh, it proves that your faith is false. Uh, <laughs> so... Saying that idolaters can inherit the kingdom of God is clearly in contradiction to scripture. And there must be other verses as well which demonstrate that. Okay. Um, so yeah, regarding uh, Romans chapter 11, uh, Paul references the Old Testament where people did not bow the knee to Baal. So that the, the point is obvious. They weren't idolaters. They were faithful to Jehovah. So that contradicts your interpretation. And you, uh, you said that reprobation 
means damning people before the world, viewing them as unfallen. And that, is, of course, is inaccurate. And I've already uh, shown that in my previous video. A reprobation, in short, means God rejecting or not choosing the non-elect. He chooses the elect for salvation. He's active in his uh, salvation of the elect, but he's permissive in his reprobation. He permits them to go to hell. He doesn't actively energize them to unbelieve, uh, dis uh, disbelieve in Jesus or active, uh, actively make them sin. Right? That's equal ultimacy. That's false doctrine that leads to God being the author of sin. But when, in regards to the elect, God sends his son into the world. Christ dies for their sins. The Holy Spirit is sent to regenerate them and to convict them of sin. He gives them the gift of faith. So it's very active when it comes to the elect and their salvation. The same cannot be said. It's not symmetrical in regards to the reprobate. Okay, uh, you claim that Adam fitted men, uh, Adam fitted, fit, uh, fitted man to destruction. And, uh, well, it's possible, but I think jumping to Romans chapter 5 is uh, not really recommended a uh, way to interpret the scriptures. You don't just ignore the context and leap all the way to an entirely different context, but it's possible that you know, your interpretation has some validity there. Uh, not all Calvinists would say that God himself actively predestined uh, the non-elect to hell. Uh, there's disagreement amongst Calvinists on that. But of course, the analogy of the potter does seem to imply that God uh, does, uh, in some sense, maybe indirectly, prepare them for destruction, but I, I recognize that Paul doesn't specifically say he, God, prepared them for destruction. I recognize that fact, and I would direct you to uh, Matthew Henry's beautiful commentary on Romans chapter 9. He, he points that out, that fitted for destruction, or ripened for destruction because of their own sin. Now, not all uh, Calvinist Bible scholars would say, would say that uh, God actively prepared them or predestined them to uh, destruction. For example, John MacArthur, in his study Bible, uh, and I, I'm not sure if you like John MacArthur, I actually assume that you hate him, but regarding uh, John, uh, regarding Romans 9.22, uh, he says, uh, Vessels of wrath. Continuing the analogy of a potter, Paul refers to those whom God has not chosen for salvation, but rather allowed to incur the just penalty for their sin, God's wrath. So because of their sin, they deserve wrath. He allowed them, instead of you know actively doing it. Prepared for destruction by their own rejection of him. So they were prepared for destruction by their own rejection of God. God does not make men sinful, but he leaves them in the sin they have chosen. He leaves them, he passes over them. So many Calvinists, including John MacArthur, would agree that God doesn't actively prepare and, and you know, create people for hell. He, he doesn't make people sin. He passes over them. And that's an important distinction. Okay, you also argued uh, that no Bible verse says God predestined people for hell. And again, it's possible that you're correct on that. And some Calvinists would agree with you on that. Some Calvinists would say it's unnecessary for God to predestine people for hell because we're already affected by original sin, and the devil is already tempting us every day. So we don't. God doesn't need to add anything to that. You know, original sin and and the devil already causes us to head in the direction of hell. But God, yes, He plucks out many people from the fire. He He saves a huge multitude of sinners by His grace, unconditional grace. So yes, some Calvinists would agree with you on that. But I would like to read you Jude. Uh, Jude chapter 1 verse 4, of course, only one chapter in Jude. It says in your beloved King James, For, thee, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lie, how do you say that? Uh, less, uh, <laughs> okay, I don't know how to say it. Uh, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So they, it says, of old, ordained to this condemnation. And First Peter chapter 2, verse 8 says, And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed, or ordained, destined. To, that, to this doom they were also appointed, says the New American Standard Version. So those verses 
seem to suggest, uh, possibly suggest that God does predestine people for doom, for destruction, but not actively causing them to sin and disbelief. That's a different thing. That's equal ultimacy. Okay, next point. Uh, you affirm free will, but totally misunderstand determinism and the reformed view of human freedom. I would direct you to what R.C. Sproul says. R.C. Sproul certainly affirms human freedom. He actually says he affirms human freedom. And of course, all the true Calvinists affirm human responsibility. We are responsible for our actions. We can't blame God and we are free. We're not free outside God's decree. We're not free to do what uh, something outside what God ordains because that would make us, you know, uh, more sovereign than God. But we are free to do what we want to do. We, we make genuine choices. Calvinists affirm that. And I would direct you to the Westminster Confession of Faith regarding free will. It says God has endured the will of man with that natural liberty. Liberty, of course, means freedom. That is neither forced nor by any absolute necessity of nature determined good or evil. It's not determined absolutely to do good or evil. And it's not forced. So, again, you're, you've misrepresented Calvinism at that point because you claimed that Calvinists believe God forces people and you use the terminology uh, that we are puppets on a string. But that is a gross misrepresentation. Also, the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith says regarding free will, God has endued the will of man by nature with liberty and the power to choose and to act upon his choice. This free will is neither forced nor destined by any necessity of nature to do good or evil. So the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith, which is Calvinistic, believes in all five points, says explicitly, it actually uses the terminology free will and doesn't refute it, doesn't say it's wrong, but agrees with free will. It says it with favor. So Calvinists have no problem with human freedom, genuine human choices. It says they have the power to, to choose. So we have no problem with the, the terminology free will or freedom or you know, you know, human choices, genuine choices, as long as you don't mean that we have the power to save ourselves or to choose God savingly or to choose heaven to choose our own destiny. But we do agree with human freedom and human responsibility. So again, uh, you've misrepresented Calvinism at that point. Now you also claim that God only predestines the elect to salvation. But I would direct you to First uh, Peter chapter 1, verse 20, where it says, um, First Peter chapter 1, verse 20, King James, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. That's referring to Christ. Christ, according to the King James, was foreordained before the foundation of the world. So Christ was predestined. So that contradicts what you said, that only the elect are predestined. And the cross was predestined according to Acts chapter 4. It says, For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together for to do what it, whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Determined. And it should be translated as predestined. The modern translation is translated as predestined. So God predestined those evil actions of those people, including the Jews and Gentiles, to crucify Jesus. To do whatever your hand and your counsel predestined to occur. So the cross was predestined. The lamb was slain before the foundation of the earth. That's Revelation 13.8. That's what the King James says. So... The lamb was predestined to go to the cross. And if you, if you deny that, I would be quite amazed by that. Now, I do understand that your video was done about a year ago, so perhaps you've learned a lot more things uh, by now. But it's still important for me to correct some of your errors. Okay. Also, um, you, you said, quote, God doesn't predestinate all events in our lives. Right? And you said it's heresy that God predestines or causes sin. Now, that's interesting because I would like to read you two verses in your beloved King James Version. 
which seem to create you a lot of problem. And the modern translations don't translate it the exact same way usually. In Isaiah 45, 7, your beloved King James says, God is speaking, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. So you claim that God doesn't cause evil and that God doesn't predestine evil. But your King James Version says in Isaiah 45, 7, that God creates evil. Now, that's not a Calvinist scholar. That's not me. That's not some theologian. That's the word of God. Now, it's inter I'll, be, I'll be interested to see how you respond to that, how you uh, explain that verse. Proverbs 16, 4, King James again, the Lord hath made all things for himself, right? All things for his own purpose. Yea, even the wicked for the day of evil, even the wicked for the day of evil. That's what the King James says. So God has created everything for his own sovereign good pleasure, his own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. When they do evil things, when they commit evil, when they cause disaster and calamity, uh, calamity etc., God has made that for a purpose. Now, it's interesting uh, if how you would deal with that verse too. Again, that's not me saying that. That's not a Calvinist saying that. That is the inspired and fallible word of God. Okay, you also said um, we can't blame God for our sin. And of course, I already said no true Calvinist blames God for their sin. If we sin, it's our own fault. We can't say, oh, God predestined me to sin, so therefore it's God's fault. I'm not responsible. That's hyper-Calvinism. That's, that's absolutely wrong. That's dangerous teaching. And, ah, and I need to read a few quotes um, regarding superlapsarianism. Again, you've misrepresented uh, superlapsarianism, and you, can, you also strongly implied, and I believe in also another video that you made, uh, that all Calvinists should be superlapsarianism, or maybe the majority are, even though uh, the minority are. Uh, most Calvinist scholars are either infra, infralapsarian or are in the middle. You know, they, they, they don't actually believe in either. They just say, you know, it's mystery, whatever. Okay, let me read you a quote. Um, way, uh, uh, Louis Burkhoff again. He says on page 122, Again, it is objected that superlapsarianism makes the decree of reprobation just as absolute as the decree of election. In other words, that it regards reprobation as purely an act of God's sovereign good pleasure and not as an act of punitive justice. According to its representation, sin does not come into consideration in the, de in the decree of reprobation, as you claimed. But this is hardly correct, though it may be true of some superlapsarians. In general, however, it may be said that while they regard preterition as an act of God's sovereign good pleasure, they usually regard pre-condemnation as an act of divine justice, which does take sin into consideration. So the superlapsarians generally do believe God takes sin into consideration when he rejects the reprobate or the non-elect, depending on the terminology that you prefer. Also, another quote. But superlapsarians abhor the idea of a tyrannical God. And at least some of them explicitly state that while preterition is an act of God's sovereign will, the second element of reprobation, namely condemnation, is an act of justice and certainly takes account of sin. So that is in contradiction to what you claimed about what superlapsarians allegedly believe. Also, Burkhoff points out that Christ was predestined. So you say only the elect were predestined, but other things were certainly predestined according to Scripture. The word for, uh, foreordained is used in the King James and 1 Peter 1.20. That's synonymous with um, predestined. So Christ as mediator was predestined. Um, he also references 1 Peter 2.4. Um, angels were predestined. And that's Mark 8.38, Luke 9.26. So, yeah. So, it, angels and Christ were predestined. And I would say all events in history were predestined according to Scripture also. So, absolute uh, predestination does not negate um, 
genuine human freedom and responsibility. And lastly, you concluded your video by saying, I am not a Calvinist by any stretch of the imagination. That's an exact quote. Uh, actually, you believe in the essence of Calvinism. You believe in unconditional election. You believe in total depravity. You believe in limited atonement. And you have misunderstood irresistible grace. And you deny the biblical uh, view of eternal security and the preservation and perseverance of the saints. So it's unfortunate that you would badly misrepresent Calvinism, even though you believe in total depravity. You know, uh, Calvinists believe in human freedom. You, you can't. You can't say we. No, no Calvinist ever says that God forces us to do things or God, uh, you know, God is the puppet master or something. That's hyper Calvinism. I'm not sure if any, I don't, I don't even know if hyper Calvinists would say that. So I think you are, for the most part, um, a Calvinist, not a five point Calvinist. It's interesting. I, I would actually regard you as a four point Calvinist denying uh, the P of Tulip, which is very, very rare. Uh, uh, not all Calvinists believe in superlapsarianism, and not uh, Calvinists don't believe in your view or your definition of absolute uh, predestination. So, in, in that regard, since you know, since Calvinists are not seven point seven pointers, and you say you only believe in three out of seven, uh, I think you believe in at least four out of the five. And Calvinism is supposed to be based on the five points. So, uh, hope hopefully I addressed everything. Uh, that's all I have time for now. I do, again, hope that you would respond. Thank you.